All right, guys, today we are taking our first dive into data science. And so you might notice that um, in Schoology, we have a brand new folder up at the top that says da data science and open data. Uh, so you can click on that folder for me. Um, tonight's homework, by the way, uh, you have a multiple choice homework number 22 for homework. Uh, don't do it in class. You have a, a Python notebook that you need to work out during class today, but this is what you could work on this evening. Or if you finish the notebook early, you could finish this up at the end of class. But right now, what you need to do for me is head into Python keys. And there is a uh, notebook key that says Romeo and Juliet. If you guys can download that, we are going to do a data science analysis of the famous Shakespeare play Romeo and Juliet. Uh, this is kind of a cool uh, notebook because you kind of will get to see um, the intersection between um, computer science and, in this case, uh, literary analysis, something that you could actually do in your English class. Uh, this might be a cool thing to tell your English teacher about. Uh, by the way, what you might want to do is download that key um, and open it in Adobe Reader in a separate window. Um, I'm going to be working through all of this code with you guys in the video, um, but you might find that having this open in Adobe Reader will be helpful if, say, I scroll away from the code too quickly or if it's blurry in the video or something. Anyway, um, after you have that downloaded, head back into the Chapter 7 folder. If you can go to Assignments, Activities, and Homework, and there's an assignment that says Romeo and Juliet. There are four files that you guys are going to need to download. rj.txt is the text of Romeo and Juliet. wc.bat is a file that will uh, load a module that we need. It's the word cloud module. Uh, then, of course, you have your IPython notebook. Notice I'm downloading all of these files. Um, and then finally, there's a heart shape. We're going to make a word cloud of the most common words in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Um, and we're going to put the words in our word cloud on this heart shape. Uh, please do not right click and save the image. I want you to click on the download image button in Schoology. And now in your downloads folder, you are going to have um, five files. Hearts.png, this IPython notebook, wc.bat, rj.txt, Romeo and Juliet.key. And if you can either drag and drop or cut and paste into in your 319 APCSP Python folder, I want you guys to make a folder named Romeo and Juliet. I already have a folder named Romeo and Juliet, of course. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to paste in all of these files. Um, this notebook will not work correctly unless um, rj.txt, heart.png, and this IPython notebook are all sitting in your Romeo and Juliet folder together. Anyway, um, now that I have all of these files together in my Romeo and Juliet folder, I'm going to double click on wc.bat, and that's going to install this word cloud module that you guys need in order for this notebook to work correctly. Now, uh, some of you guys will already have the module installed. Um, if someone in a previous period install it, installed it, I believe it'll already be installed for you. Um, but just in case, double click on wc.bat, let it do its thing, and once that is done, you can go back to um, your APCSP Python folder and launch your notebooks. That's going to open up Jupyter. And you'll see we'll get this navigator from Jupyter. You can clip a, click on your new Romeo and Juliet folder. And you guys are going to want that IPython notebook. And here it is, Romeo and Juliet, a quantitative analysis. Um, so I got this text from William Shakespeare's uh, Romeo and Juliet. It was sitting on Gutenberg.org, which is a great um, database of uh, a bunch of English literature that has entered the public domain. So basically, poetry and plays and novels um, that are in the public domain, they archive those on Gutenberg, and you could do um, you could do an analysis of other Shakespeare plays if you wanted to. You could do an analysis of a Charles Dickens novel. Uh, all of the tools in here would work on any play or uh, or novel that you were interested in. Um, anyway, uh, when you guys are opening files in Windows, you would go 
you know, if you wanted to see Romeo and Juliet just in Notepad++, you could double click on rj.txt and you could see that this entire play will open up as a text file, either in Notepad or in Notepad++, depending on what your default file is. And you could read all of the words of this play if you want. It'll take a really long time to do that analysis. So instead, in Python, we're going to analyze this text uh, without reading all of the words ourselves. We're going to have the computer do a lot of the work. Um, so just like we opened that text file in, um, in Notepad, um, we're going to have Python open this text file in its own uh, way, in its own, uh, in its own way of doing it. Um, I'm going to write a variable play equals open rj.txt. Um, I'm going to convert this, basically this variable is now this file opened up as binary data. Well, I'm going to convert this binary data to um, an actual string. So I'm going to say full text equals play.read. I'm reading in that binary data as a string. And then, um, you know, if I'm going to do some text analysis here, I better make all the words in the play lowercase. Um, because, you know, let's say that the word love appears somewhere with a capital L, and then the word love appears somewhere else as a lowercase l. I want to recognize the word love as the same word, whether it's uppercase or lowercase. So I'm going to go into my full text, and I am going to store that variable as full text.lower. I'm going to basically make all the words lowercase. Um, the other thing is I'm going to strip out punctuation. Um, the word love with an exclamation point at the end should be treated as the same as the word love without an exclamation point. So I'm going to strip out um, all punctuation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for each character, for each char in character list, uh, basically for each um, punctuation mark in my character list here, I'm going to say full text equals I'm going to do full text dot replace. I'm using the replace method, and I'm going to replace instances of punctuation with an empty string. And finally, uh, we've done this before in a, in a, when we were doing JavaScript. I'm going to make word list equal to full text dot split. I'm using the dot split method to split my uh, my play to split my text into a list of words. Finally, uh, why don't we print out, say, the first 50 words of the play. Let's make sure that this data looks like what we would expect. Shift enter here. And there we go, The Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. And then it continues on with the play. Uh, if you wanted to, you could up it to 100 words, right? And there's the first 100 words of Romeo and Juliet. Um, this would not be a very fun way to read the novel, um, but this is a good data structure for analyzing uh, or not the, the, the novel, it's not a novel, it's a play. But anyway, this would not be a very fun way to read the play, but this is a good data structure for analyzing this text using a computer. Uh, first of all, you might be curious, hey, how many words do I have to read if I'm going to read Romeo and Juliet? Well, I could print the length of my word list. And about 25,000 words. Romeo and Juliet is 25,000 words of reading. Um, maybe you might be curious, what are the most common words in the play, right? Um, does Shakespeare use the word love more than the, he uses the word hate? Does Shakespeare use the name Romeo more than he uses the name Juliet? And so uh, there's a library called Collections, really powerful library, um, and we're going to use that library to create a counter variable. So I'm going to say count equals collections.counter. I'm accessing the counter module. I'm going to make a counter variable um, basically by looping over my um, my play and accumulating all of the word frequencies. So say the love the word love appears 50 times while the word Romeo appears a hundred times, something like that. Um, the code's easy to write. I'm going to say word frequencies equals count word list. Then I'm going to print word frequencies. Um, and this just made a, a, a little counter object. Um, all I'm doing is I'm using the counter method in the collections module. 
um, and I gave that a name. I called it count. So when I say count word list, really what I mean is use the collections counter method on my word list. Um, anyway, the vocabulary is not too important here. The more important thing is we could see that Shakespeare uses the word and in his play 700 times, the word the 676 times, so on and so forth. Now, uh, that might not be very interesting at first glance, right? Because the word and um, kind of makes sense that that word would appear very frequently in Romeo and Juliet because the word and in the English language appears a lot in every text. So we might need to do a little bit of work to strip out boring words like and and the and I that don't really tell us too much, but it's a good start. Uh, by the way, if you're wonder wondering what data structure this is, this data structure, its data type is uh, unique to this collections module. It's a collections counter, it's a collections counter object. Um, it's its own data structure for this module, which is a fairly common thing. We've already seen that happen before. Uh, NumPy also had that. Anyway, um, looking a list at a list of all of the most frequent words is a little overwhelming. This is a lot of data. Look at this. Uh, that's a little scary. So instead, I'm just going to make a top 20 list. So I'm going to print the top 20 words in the play um, for each word and frequency in my word frequencies. Here's the top 20 most common words. And again, you can see very boring. And, the, I, to, a. Uh. We've got to do better than that. So we're going to have to strip out some of the most common words of the English language that don't really tell us very much about the, the play. So I'm going to import a module called NLTK. I'm importing NLTK because I did some research and found out that NLTK is a module that has a list of stop words. You can shift enter on that cell. Uh, stop words are really common words in the English language that we want to strip out of our data before we do our analysis. Now in this next cell, um, we are importing our stop words. Oh, by the way, you could see this just turned red because it took a little while to download those stop words, but they have, they just finished downloading. Anyway, um, I am going to import stop words from the English language. These are words like the and 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 I, so on and so forth. Um, I, I'm going to extend that list though. So right here I say stop word list dot extend. Um, there's a couple other words that I found out um, need to be taken out of my list, like Rom and Jewel. Those are not actually words from Romeo and Juliet. They're stage directions. This is Rom means Romeo is about to speak, or Jewel means Juliet is about to speak. Same thing with Friar, same thing with Ben, same thing with Nurse, same thing with Mare. So I'm taking out basically stage directions that are not really part of the play. And uh, I could print out that list of stop words so you could just see everything that I'm going to be stripping out of my list. So I could print stop word list. And you can see these are all the words I'm going to take out of the play. And let's do it. Let's loop over um, our list. So for each stop word in stop word list, I'm going to delete from my word frequencies that particular stop word. And then uh, I'm going to reinitialize top 20 to equal word frequencies dot most common 20. And then I can print it. Basically, uh, I'm making a new top 20 list. Uh, you could change this number, right? Most common 20, you could change that to any number you want. But maybe 20 is a good am amount of words to make a, a top 10 list or a top 20 list or a top 30 list, right? 20 is a, a reasonable number to work with. You probably don't want a top 1,000 list. You, uh, a top 100 list, maybe still a little too big. 20 is reasonable. Um, thou, thy, and thee. Those might have been good stop words to add, but they sound really Shakespeare-y, so I kind of liked leaving them. So 277 instances of the word thou, the, then thy, and then thee. Now we start to get to interesting ones. Romeo appears 130 times. Love, 128 times. Look at this, though. Juliet, only 55. If you are you know, uh, someone who does literary, literary research, 
um, you might say, hey, that's interesting. Romeo, the male character, his name appears 130 times in the text. Juliet, the female character, only 55. And that might, you know, as a data scientist, you might be starting to think, oh, that might be an area for inquiry. Um, and we will address that in a little bit. I think that is an interesting literary point to, to uh, dive a little bit deeper into. That's what you do as a data scientist, is you dive into the data, and after you've done your deep dive into the data, you use data visualization to show off what you learned. Uh, humans struggle with getting information from, from tables and from lists and from spreadsheets. We're not good at it. Um, and so visualization is a, use, a way to use like graphs and charts to communicate data that would otherwise be unenlightening for a person. Uh, good vis visualizations can help people get meaningful insights from data. That's why data scientists produce visualizations. And so anyway, for the rest of this notebook, uh, you, you mostly just have to shift enter on the code. Um, I, I wrote the code for you ahead of time, and uh, your job is to press shift enter and see the visualization that you get. But also, I do want you to read through the code that I've provided. Um, you don't need to memorize how to make a bar chart or a pie chart or a histogram. But I do expect that when you're doing your open data project in a couple days, that you can go back to old notebooks like this one and look at how we made a pie chart and use that to make your own pie chart. So you might be doing some copy paste change rather than, than writing the, co the code from scratch. But that means that today, right now, you should be reading through these ugly blocks of code. Like, for example, this block of code. Don't just shift enter on this thing. Um, and look at the graph, we're also going to go back and look at the code. So first of all, let's look at the graph and then see what it does. And then we'll look back at the code we used to make it. So I've got a chart titled Romeo and Juliet, most frequent words. And I've sorted this by word frequency. So thou is the most common word after, after I've removed all my stop words, then thy, then thee, then Romeo. And look, we can start to get some cool insights. Romeo appears over a hundred times. And then all the way down this list, Juliet, almost near the end, only 55 times. So again, this data visualization is already giving us a chance to um, make some insights about the text just by looking at these relative frequencies in this bar chart. Anyway, uh, let's do a quick run through this code. Um, that's what I'm expecting you guys to do uh, throughout the rest of this notebook is look at this code, uh, try to take as much information in as possible. You don't have to be able to do this from scratch, but you do need to understand the basic outline of what I've done. So first of all, I changed top 20 to a dictionary. Um, so I changed data structures to a dictionary. Then uh, these two lines of code are standard. Every time you create a plot, you're gonna import matplotlib and use this inline code to be able to show the plot in your Jupyter notebook. Um, the rest of this, there's some new parts and some not so new parts. Um, plot style. This is kind of cool. Uh, you could experiment here. This is um, a way of changing what the styling on your plot will look like. Um, so ggplot is one set of styling. 538 is another one I like. You could try this out, right? Like ch try changing to anything in this list and it just changes the colors and the fonts and the font sizes um, to a different style. So what else? Um, a plot title and labeling the axes. This is always very, very important when you're making a good data visualization. Data range. Um, a bar chart needs to know how many bars to make. And so our data range is really just how long our top 20 list is. By the way, a top 20 list is 20 bars long. So we're telling it to make 20 bars in the bar chart. Value list. Remember that a dictionary has um, it has values and it has keys. In this case, the values in our dictionary are the word frequencies. Thy appears 277 times. Juliet appears 55 times. These are the heights of the bars in our bar chart. The values in our dictionary are the heights of the bars in the bar chart. Um, then we're making plot a plot dot bar. Okay, we're making a bar chart. We're making a plot. What kind of plot? A bar chart. Our data range is how many bars to make. Value list are the labels for those bars. So the values from our um, top 20 list, um, let's see, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. The values from our top 20 list are the heights of the bars. And then key lists, the keys from our dictionary, those are the labels for the bars. So here where I'm doing plot.xticks and I have key list, um, this is labeling the bar chart. So plot.bar makes the bars of the various heights. Plot.xticks labels those bars in that bar chart. And there it is. Thou is really frequent. Juliet is relatively infrequent. We have our first visualization. Uh, there's other ways of making bar charts, so that's not the only way of doing it. Uh, here's another one that you could try. Um, I'm importing a new module called an operator, uh, called the operator module. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use this operator module to reverse my list. My first list is descending. Uh, frequent words followed by less frequent words followed by even less frequent words, so tall bars all the way down to short bars. Um, this code is just a way of showing, hey, I could actually reverse those bars. And when you shift enter on these, um, the idea is to have uh, the, the least frequent words building up to the most frequent word. Um, again, don't get too bogged down in, uh, you know, I, I'm never going to expect in this class that you guys are going to be writing this sort of code from memory. Uh, if you ever wanted to reverse your list, I would expect that you would go back to this notebook and get this code to reverse your list from to have it go in ascending order from less frequent to more frequent. So you don't have to memorize this, you would just need to know how where to go back to find it if you ever needed it. Uh, now making this bar chart, a lot of it's really similar. Look, import matplotlib, show our plots in line. Um, I'm importing NumPy. Um, I'm styling my graph. So ggplot, you could change this to something else, like dark background if you wanted to. If you shift enter again. Oh, cool. Um, it's a dark background. Kind of neat looking. It really pops like that. Um, and then uh, you could see the, uh, the rest of it is pretty standard. Uh, figure size, uh, 10 units wide, 5 units tall. It's the length and width of my graph. Uh, titles and labels. Uh, there's some funny stuff going on in here. Don't get too bogged down in this. Um, you could look through it if you would like, but I'm not really going to go through much detail here. Uh, but you have this now as a resource if you ever want to create a bar chart that looks like this. You have, have uh, some resources to look back at. So anyway, another cool example of a bar chart. And then uh, I think maybe my favorite one. Uh, this is again going to be a bar chart just another way of making a bar chart. What I like about this last visualization of a bar chart is it uses a module called pandas. And this pandas module is really popular with professional data scientists. If you go find some uh, research scientists or some data scientists or some statisticians and you ask them, hey, uh, what's your favorite module in Python for working with large data sets? Uh, they're very likely to tell you pandas. It's a really powerful module specifically designed for working with huge data sets. Uh, and the way they make this possible is they have created two new data structures that are unique to this module, um, a pandas data series and a pandas data frame. Uh, we'll learn more about pandas data series and panda data frames uh, later on this chapter. But for now, I want you to look at how um, compact this code is and how beautiful the chart is. So go ahead and shift enter and we get this beautiful bar chart hopefully. Yeah. Uh, oh. Oh, I still have dark background on. Um, I'm going to switch this back my style. I need to switch that back to ggplot. Um, you guys are going to have to do that with me. Um, so I was experimenting here and unfortunately it kind of messed up one of my plots. So uh, I did plot style use dark background. Well, the dark background looks pretty neat for this bar chart, but um, it messed things up in this one. Uh, the text is white, and white on white is not going to show up. So in my pandas data frame, in this code, um, I'm going to need to add an extra line of code, plot.style.use. Let's switch it back to ggplot and let's cross our fingers that, yeah, there we go. Uh, look how nice this plot is. 
uh, the bars are all different colors. Um, it really pops because of that. Let me show you again the line of code that I added that you'll probably also have to add if your plot does not look nice. So anyway, import pandas, import matplotlib, um, show your plot in line. Um, I'm creating a figure. The style for that figure, the style for that plot, I'm switching it back to ggplot because uh, dark background is causing problems for us. Now, look at how simple the rest of this code is. Pandas is easier to work with than some other modules. Um, I'm creating a pandas data series from my top 20 list. Uh, this print is just to show you what the data series looks like. If you don't like this print, you can comment it out after you've run the code to get it out of the way. And then anyway, look at this. It's only uh, six lines of code then uh, to create the plot. Create a bar chart, create a, a plot. What kind of plot? A bar chart. My X ticks. Um, the number of bars is 20. And then the labels for those bars are the keys from my dictionary. Um, the, thy, thou, Romeo, Juliet, whatever. Here's the title and my plot labels. And then finally, this last, the sixth line of code, this last line of code, uh, show the bar chart. Done. And there it is. Um, anyway, you're probably getting sick of bar charts by now, which you should be. So let's do a different kind of visualization. Let's create a word cloud. Um, a word cloud is just like a piece of artwork that shows the most frequent words in a text as really large words and the least, the less frequent words in the text as uh, smaller words. Um, really, all you need to do is shift enter on this code and let it do its thing. It's going to take a couple seconds to generate. It's not going to happen instantly. But here's our word cloud. It's heart shaped. Where did that heart shape come from? Well, in your Romeo and Juliet folder, you had heart.png. This is called um, an image mask. Uh, this is an image that word cloud is using to put um, the words onto this shape. Um, Romeo and Juliet, since it's uh, the most famous love story in the English language, makes sense to use a heart. Um, if you were, say, um, doing a word cloud for Harry Potter, maybe you would have an image mask that looks like Hogwarts Academy or something, and then you would um, you know, put the words onto the, the kind of shape of the buildings in Hogwarts. Um, the image mask is whatever whatever you want it to be. By the way, if this word cloud did not pop out, really make sure that you double clicked on this wc.bat. This was the installation file for this word cloud module. So if you didn't double click that, when you shift entered on this code, it may have not worked. Um, anyway, I will never expect that you would know how to write a word cloud from scratch. There's a lot of code here. And so the, the expectation would not be that you can do this from scratch. Instead, it's that if you ever wanted to make your own word cloud, I would expect that you could go back to um, this block of code and make changes to it for the word cloud you're trying to make. For example, take a look right here, uh, this line of code where I said text equals open rj.txt. Well, if you're making a word cloud of the first Harry Potter novel, it wouldn't be rj.txt, it would be harrypotter.txt. Or if instead of a um, heart for your image mask, you wanted some other shape or some other uh, image, you would put a different image file there. Um, yeah, and there's our word cloud. Uh, and it's a nice visualization. We could see that the word love is uh, the most one of the most common words in Romeo and Juliet. Romeo, really common. Look at that. Poor Juliet. Um, Juliet and Tybalt are mentioned almost the same number of times in the text. You could tell because their font size is about the same. Anyway, um, all of this talk about the relative frequencies of Romeo versus Juliet might be making you think, hey, is there some gender bias in Romeo and Juliet? Um, you know, this was written in Elizabethan England. It was a different era. Is are we seeing some gender bias in the text? Um, and I'll, I'll put a little bit of a caveat here. Um, I don't have a PhD in English literature. Um, I am not a, uh, an expert in Shakespearean English, so I can't really give you a definitive answer to my question. Um, but that's not what we do as data scientists. 
A data scientist's job is not to give a definitive answer to that question. It's, a, it's to explore and produce evidence, and that evidence may support our hypothesis, and it could be used um, by an English professor or by um, a, a historical researcher or by an expert in um, Elizabethan literature um, as a piece of evidence as part of the exploration. So we're not, we're not trying to come up with a definitive answer here. This is just a piece of the exploration. Uh, that being said, I think we have um, a really compelling piece of evidence. So step one, here's what, here's what I did first. I came up with a list of gendered nouns and pronouns that appear in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, so here's a parallel set of lists. She versus he, her versus his, woman versus man, girl versus boy, and I have a bunch of them. Two parallel lists. The first list is uh, female gendered, the second list is male gendered. Then I'm going to go through and I'm going to count the instances of these words in the text. So I'm going to, I need to shift enter on my female list and my male list. Don't forget to do that. Now I'm going to shift enter on this next block of code. What does this block of code do? Well, I'm setting two counters, a female counter and a male counter. Uh, for each word in my word list, uh, for each word in the play, for each word in the Romeo and Juliet, if that word is in female list, increment the female counter. Same thing with the male list. If you find a male gendered word in Romeo and Juliet, increment the male counter. And then I'm making a list of the female counter versus the male counter. And look at that. 401 instances of female words versus 618 instances of male words. Um, again, uh, humans are not great at getting uh, information from a list or from a spreadsheet or from a table, we're much better with a plot, a visualization. So here's my visualization. All it is is a, a pie chart, just like the pie charts you guys have already made. And look at that, gendered pronouns in Romeo and Juliet. Female nouns appear 39.4% of the time versus masculine nouns 60.6% of the time. And that's pretty cool. Um, we now have a compelling piece of evidence that Perhaps maybe there is some gender bias built into the text of Romeo and Juliet, uh, perhaps because it was written uh, during Eliz Elizabethan times, and there might have been some different cultural norms at that point in history. Um, so here's what the data says. The data says there are six masculine nouns in the text for every four feminine nouns. We have some data that appears to support our hypothesis that maybe there's some gender bias in Romeo and Juliet. Um, now, uh, be careful here, right, because... Um, maybe gendered noun frequency is not um, a perfect definition for gender bias, right? Word frequency and bias are not necessarily the same thing. So we need we would need to do a little more research to determine whether um, maybe like actually read the play, right? We didn't read the play right now. All we did was look at word frequencies. So there's there's more analysis you would really need to do before you could say publish these results. But uh, the other thing to consider is uh, we're, we're not really experts in Shakespeare, we're not really experts in Elizabethan England, and so maybe there's some texts, textual evidence or historical context we're missing. Um, so the point here is, we've got some good data, we've got a good hypothesis, we have some good evidence, um, but we probably would have to do some further analysis before we could like publish our results, for example. Um, anyway, uh, this gives you an idea of what a data scientist does, right? Because a data scientist uh, works in, in, in an interdisciplinary field. Uh, what I mean by that is a data scientist is kind of a statistician, kind of a computer programmer, and kind of an interdisciplinary expert. We just did literary analysis for the entire period, but through the lens of statistics and through the lens of data science. And that's kind of what a data scientist does. Use their knowledge in biology, use their knowledge in the field of literature, use their knowledge in the field of mathematics, um, in journalism, in politics and economics. Um, anyway, remember that a data scientist doesn't really have to give a definitive answer to every question they ask. Um, you're telling a story with the data, and I think we did that today. I think we really did tell a compelling story with our data. Um, our insight is a piece of a puzzle, right? Um, we have a piece of evidence showing that there might be some gender bias in William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Uh, we have one piece of that puzzle. 
Uh, the more pieces you have, the more data analysis you do, the more clear the picture becomes. But we're, this is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, anyway, uh, here's a good article if you're interested in this. Uh, the best data scientists know how to tell stories. This is a great little article about how data scientists use visualizations and use data to tell a story, not to necessarily come up with a definitive answer to the questions they're asking. And finally, you have a couple tasks. These are homework. Um, I'll set a due date in Schoology for you. Um, I will double check. I would guess that Mr. Nichols has these due Friday at 7.30 a.m., but check Schoology for the definitive answer because I will set my deadline to be the same as Mrs. Wong and Mr. Nichols. But anyway, here's your task. Um, first of all, uh, I want you to create a list of tuples uh, where the first part of the tuple is a unique word in Romeo and Juliet, and uh, the second part of the tuple is its frequency. So uh, Juliet comma 55, or Romeo comma 135. Um, then that, that's a frequency list. By the way, that code, you could probably find it above, right? So uh, the code you need to do this um, should not be too hard to find. In fact, you might find that this code does the trick. Maybe try printing it. Anyway, what I want you to do is um, I want you to find all singletons in the play. A singleton is a word that appears in the play only once. Uh, so you are doing the opposite of what we did above. Above we are looking for frequent words. You are going to find um, all instances of singletons, words that only appear in Romeo and Juliet a single time. And again, like I said, the code above might help you. And also this little bullet point might be helpful. Um, then I want you to write some code to tell me how many singletons are in the play. How many words appear in Romeo and Juliet only a single time? And finally, um, I want you to use this provided code, we gave you some code here, uh, to sort the strings and singleton list from longest to shortest. What are the longest singletons and what are the shortest, basically what are the really long words that only appear in Shakespeare only once? sorted all the way to the what are the really short words that appear in Romeo and Juliet only once. And your job is to find two or three words that look interesting to you, keep them school appropriate, and give me their definition. And if you think this is as cool as I do, maybe tell your English teacher how in AP Computer Science today um, we did literary analysis and we learned about uh, a Shakespeare play. They might find that kind of cool. Um, thank you guys. Don't forget that you have a multiple choice due tomorrow, multiple choice number 22, and check Schoology for the deadline on this notebook. Thanks. Have a good one.